Well, hello, we're here with Judy Human. I'm Virginia Nolton Marcus. I'm a white woman with short brown hair and teal colored glasses and top on and a black pants. And I'm wearing a scarf around my neck that is also teal and yellow. And Judy, I'd like to start by saying how long and much I've admired your inner wisdom and strength of conviction. You've surmounted so many barriers and stared down intimidation and discrimination starting from when you were a kid in New York, denied an education, and a young adult denied the opportunity to become an educator. And you really quickly recognized that you were not the problem. The world needed to change. Meanwhile, so many people with disabilities seem to be hampered by internalized ableism and stigma. And so I know you've given a lot of credit to your parents, but I'd like to hear some of the other factors that have um, uh, developed your, your clarity of purpose and your courageous leadership. First of all, thank you so much for your comments. I really appreciate it. For the audience, I'm a 74 year old white disabled woman. I have brown hair with highlights, highlights that I got put in when I went to the Oscars last year because someone who did makeup and hair said, oh, you've got to put in highlights, so I did. And today I'm wearing a, um, a little jacket with black uh, rim and pink and black. I'm wearing like aubergine pants in my motorized wheelchair. So the reason I've always talked about my mother and father so much is because I had polio when I was 18 months old in 1949. So obviously I had no authority or knowledge or capacity at such a young age to really be able to influence what was happening to me. And in many ways, when people ask me who my role model is or who my role models were, I frequently will talk about my parents because um, we're Jewish, we're German Jews. My parents uh, were sent out of Germany when they were 12 and 14. My mom was an only child, so she was sent to live with a distant relative that she didn't know. My dad was 14 when he was sent out, but he went to Brooklyn and he knew a number of the relatives there. So my mother really um, at 12 was on her own. And the family that she lived with was, I never met them, um, but they were a caring, loving family. But nonetheless, they didn't speak German. I don't think my mother didn't speak English in the beginning. So when I started thinking about who made a difference in my life, it was my parents who really said things like, when the doctor said they should institutionalize me when I was two, and they made the decision not to do that. Um, I was the oldest. My brother had been born like a month after I had polio and was in the hospital. So my parents could have made different decisions. And then, you know, they decided... I'm sure very quickly that they had no intention of putting me in an institution and really saw their responsibility to be good parents. And like many parents, you prepare your kids to go to school and you frequently take them to school their first day of school. So my mother took me to school um, to register me and was informed by the principal that I was a fire hazard and couldn't go to that school. And I remember, you know, clearly being disappointed, but obviously not really understanding what was going on. So I never went to kindergarten when I was six. I still didn't get into school, but the Board of Ed in Brooklyn started sending a teacher to the house. So that was for the first, second, third, and a half of the fourth grade. And my mother continually was looking for places to try to get me into school. So it was this consistent, persistent, drumbeat that really um, allowed me to begin to learn at a very early age about advocacy. And um, my mother was a networker, like from when I had polio. So she was in her ninth month pregnancy. And the way they were able to do that is they had friends in the neighborhood and neighbors would take care of my brother when she was going to the hospital when I was because I was in the hospital for a fair amount of time. And my dad worked full time. So a lot of the characteristics that I have 
I very much go back to my mother and my father uh, to a degree also, a little bit more on steroids. And I think for me, this natural progression um, was impacted by the fact that when I did finally start going to school, it was with other disabled kids in a regular school, but classes I went to had only disabled children. And there I was beginning to learn much more graphically about low expectations. In many ways, it's not that people had low expectations for me, but the class that I first went into when I was nine had some children that were my age and other classes had kids younger and then kids who were 15, 16, 17, 18 years old in a school for non-disabled kids, which ended up sixth grade. So it was very clear, although unclear because I was nine, that what was going on wasn't correct. And I think that really, I mean, I remember pretty early on going over to Joni Lapadula and, uh, and Jill Kirshner and trying to help them learn how to read more. And I was like nine or 10. So it was this continually thinking that people could do more than other people thought they could do. But for me, when I think about working with these kids on trying to learn how to read more, that kind of makes me feel like a part of who I really am. It's like looking at what more can be done when it seems like other people have given up. You talk about your um, Board of Education case in your excellent book, Being Human, an unrepentant memoir of a disability rights activist. And the book also details your section 504 activism that's so vividly depicted in Crip Camp, as well as passage of the ADA, your work at the World Bank, um, and as uh, US Department of State Special Advisor for International Disability Rights, and even how you met your husband, Jorge. Um, and you wrote this book together with Kristen Joyner, and you recently wrote another book together called Rolling Warrior, the incredible, sometimes awkward, true story of a rebel girl on wheels who helped spark a revolution. Can you please tell us about that book or these books and their significance? So um, Rolling Warrior is an outgrowth of being human. It's very similar. It's just um, got some changes in it so that it, it deals, it's more readable for a younger audience, younger meaning 10 to 12 years old. But we did the book because people for many years had been, I'm a storyteller. So anybody you know, like you who knows me and has heard me speak, I always tell stories because I think it makes it real because my stories are not atypical. Some of them may be a little bit different, but there's always somebody who's had a similar experience. And I think stories, not just in the area of disability, but when you're trying to get people to relate to something, whether it's serious or funny or, and I'm not very funny, although people say I'm very sarcastic and I make people <laughs> laugh, but um, that I find that uh, it, it evokes better discussions because people then start thinking about their stories, even if it's not the same situation. But so people were like, oh, you've got to write a book. And I'm no, I'm really not a strong writer. I'm a much stronger speaker. So it was at the end of the Obama administration. And um, I was approached by a group of people who were interested in the book and writing, having me write the book. And so we ultimately agreed that they would help me find a writer and an agent. And we did, and uh, kind of history. So uh, Kristen and I had never met each other, but I think it was in June of 2017 that we did meet in person and liked each other and decided that uh, she didn't have a disability, she still doesn't, um, but I liked the way she thought. And I knew in the beginning that it was gonna be challenging because 
as a non-disabled person, she really, um, she's a progressive thinker, but nonetheless didn't really understand disability. But I think in the end, we learned a lot from each other. And I, for me, the book strikes the balance that I wanted where people very frequently talk about how they related to the stories, particularly disabled people who can talk about that. But non-disabled people, I think, um, also very much relate to it. And one of the important parts about this book and the other book and the film, Crip Camp, which I was also in, um, is the common comment of how come we didn't know this story. And it's not how come we didn't know the story of Judy Human. It's how come we didn't know the story of the disability rights movement. It's history, it's evolution, it's revolution. So I think the book and the books, and I'm working on a book right now with two other disabled women on for children four to eight. Okay. So interesting time. Yeah. Now I'm gonna pick up the thread of the learning to be assertive because I know as a result of the lawsuit we were talking about, you were thrust into a media spotlight at a very young age <laughs> and at a time when disabled people were essentially invisible in the media. Um, and then fast forward to a couple of years ago when you actually wrote the white paper, um, The Road to Inclusion, Changing the Face of Disability in the Media. So can you talk to us a little bit about how your um, experience with and perception of the media has evolved over the years? It's a great question. So as you were saying, I was out of college, so I was like 22, I think. And I was denied my right to teach. And then a group of us started um, you know, thinking about what we needed to do. And um, I get a friend of mine at that point who was doing some work with the New York Times, the disabled guy, got um, the person who wrote the article, Malcolm, um, to write this piece, which I didn't know anything about. So it came out on a Wednesday and the next day, the uh, editorial came out in the New York Times. And that same day I got a call from the Today Show. And I was like, I've never been on TV and I've never been on TV nationally. And should I do this? And that did take me a second to say, of course, you're gonna do it. And I think there was something about not really being able to be prepared. Um, and I just thought, I'm not gonna lose this opportunity that stuck with me forever. Um, one day I was working in California and I was invited to a meeting with the governor, Governor Brown. And I remember thinking the same thing, that he was no different than me and no different than us and I shouldn't be treating anybody any differently and just do and say what you think, politely, firmly. But that's, I think it was very much due to what happened, as you said, as a result of uh, the, the media attention. Mm -hmm. well, it's kind of interesting that it seems like in, early in your career, you focused more on legal rights advocacy and then of pivoted to um, communications advocacy. There's the, the books, um, the movie Crip Camp, um, and your podcast, your excellent podcast, The Human Perspective. And, you know, as you mentioned, I, I still think that despite all this great work, it still seems like outside of our own community, um, the disability rights movement is the greatest story never told. And I'd like to hear your perspective on um, you know, penetrating mainstream media? It's a great question. And I mean, I would say that I always had felt media was very important. And the issue of being able to penetrate media is something that I was involved with. So in New York, with the lawsuit, um, we set up a group called Disabled in Action. And we, for example, had a demonstration outside of the New York Times because they just would not cover disability on any page but health, science, and social ed pages. 
And so at that point, we were already looking at what do we need to do to get people to look at this issue as a rights-based issue. And one of the disadvantages that we had and still significantly have is that we don't have enough people with disabilities who are really a part of mainstream media. I mean, in media, you know, depending on the medium that you're using, being able to be objective is very important. However, you know, women, black people, Latinos, on and on, when they are in different positions, it is a part of who they are. Their background is a part of who they are. And I think that very much is reflected in the way people do investigations and in the way they sit around at a table and explore ideas of things that need to happen, people that should be interviewed, themes and topics that should be discussed. And the absence of that, I think, is still a major issue. So while we are definitely seeing small progress, and I know sometimes people are like, oh, don't call it small because you can name this movie and that movie, and, and there are more disabled people who are now showing up in films and television, et cetera. But still, I am looking forward to the day when you look at major talk shows, for example, whether it be MSNBC or CNN or Fox or whatever you're looking at, that when people are being brought in to discuss issues that have acknowledged and expertise in disability would be a great part of those discussions. And I think still today, while we see and know, for example, in the area of voting, that disability rights groups like the American Association of People with Disabilities and their program called Rev Up has been doing really great work on getting disabled people registered to vote. They're a nonpartisan group helping people learn about what happens if they're having difficulty when they're trying to vote on and on, being involved in development of questions to ask candidates, et cetera. Um, when you hear people talk about issues like voting and repression around voting. The word disabled people is almost never used. And to me, that's really a real indication that for some reason, this group is typically not spoken about, even though people are working with these groups on issues like voting. Right, and you were a huge voting, voting block, right? I mean, one out of five. So um, I sure hope that uh, politicians will pay attention to the issues that, that matter to us and that we can um, defend against these incursions into voting rights. But I really, um, I appreciate the, the communications advocacy work you're doing because all these years in legal advocacy and, you know, we, we win victories and that's just sort of the beginning of the work, right? But really all we can do is sort of um, change people's behavior, right? It's telling our stories that will really um, change people's hearts and minds. So that's, for example, one reason why Disability Rights North Carolina is, um, is pleased to uh, partner with Arts Access to bring Crip Camp um, to a wider audience, because I just think the arts are a great tool for, um, you know, advancing disability justice. Advancing discussions. I mean, I think I completely agree with you. So my doing more work in the area of media really came about in kind of a fluky way. Um, so when Secretary Clinton lost for presidency, I was intending to be working in her administration. And so I didn't have a job. And so when I needed to start thinking about what I could do, I was old enough to retire, but I have no interest in... <laughs> retiring. So I started setting up a company and it was about the same time as the Ford Foundation started to do more work in the area of disability, where that relatively new president at that time, Darren Walker, he called me one day and asked if I would be interested in being a senior fellow at the foundation. And of course, I was very humbled and surprised by that. And uh, he said, you can do anything that you want. And so I thought, okay, 
let's look at the issue of media and representation. I think we can certainly see changes that are going on, but where we want to be as a community, we're not there yet. No, we're not. But talk about great representation in, in Crip Camp. I, I still believe that it should have won the Oscar for Best Documentary last year, but um, you show up in this film as a camp counselor. And I don't think I've ever heard the story about how you came to have that job. What is your Camp Jeanette backstory? So um, I had been a camper at Jeanette, oh, probably for about five years, four or five years, um, from when I was like 12 or 13. I'd gone to another camp earlier, Camp Oakhurst, and Camp Jeanette, you could stay longer. So that's one of the reasons why I went there. And, you know, because it was um, when I was a teenager, it was a real great opportunity to spend time with some teenagers that I didn't know and some that I knew from school and to really begin to um, think more about our futures like other kids that age were doing. But we didn't really have many disabled role models who had graduated high school, gone to college, were getting jobs. We didn't know that age group yet. And so you know, going to camp was an opportunity to explore, to create, to gain confidence. And I think between camp and camp, you know, during the school year, it was an opportunity for me at least to begin to explore a little bit more about areas of interest. I loved the camp because it had given me so much and I made so many friends. So it was a good next step. Mm -hmm. You know, in Crip Camp, another one of your traits that I've always admired really shines through. And that is your gift for connecting with and encouraging people. Even today, after gracing the cover of Time Magazine, you're still so humble and, and approachable and such a good friend and, and mentor to so many of us. I'd like to hear you talk a little bit about inclusive leadership and why it matters. Well, I feel we all play a different role. And some people are better orators and some people are better writers and some people are better thinkers. And for me, I've always felt that I liked working with other people and that no one person independently can make the changes that we're looking at. And as you were saying earlier, you know, we can work really hard on getting laws passed, but ultimately if those laws aren't appropriately implemented, which means people need to understand what their rights are with the new laws or what they're not, what they wanna keep fighting for or the progress they've made, but what more needs to happen. If you can't exercise your rights for lack of knowledge or you need to be supported by other people to help you learn how to deal with a problem. And that's something I'm sure you experience a lot in the years that you've worked with PNAs and others, that sometimes people need a sounding board. You know, I've got this problem. I think I should do this. And being able to give people advice about, well, these what I think your options are go ahead and do what you want, but these are my feelings. And I'm there to be helpful if you need to talk again. And um, like really helping to enlarge the circle of people who have, are growing in their confidence of who they are and also then can help other people. And I think that's one of the really important parts of the disability movement that we're seeing more and more is that People, for example, with invisible disabilities are really beginning to look at how it's important for them to look at identifying because there are laws that they can be protected by. And so, I mean, I just see that right now I've moved more into doing communication, but ultimately many people that I'm speaking with over Zoom typically are, um, are wanting to be able to ask questions and either to help other people in a group they may be a part of 
or to learn more for themselves to address an issue that's impacting themselves and others. And so I think it's really the next level of how do we get the message out to more people? Because as you know, so we talk about 60 million people in the US and 60 million disabled people in the US and internationally more than 1 billion. And so these discussions are critically important um, if for no other reason than really to help people gain confidence and be able to keep moving the needle forward. Yeah, it's really true with invisible disabilities. I mean, you know, we've gone from feeling like we had this secret we had to shield to, um, you know, I had so many young people ask me, should I disclose? And it's the same thing, you know, well, here's the pros and cons and do what you believe. And now um, people have so much disability pride. I just think it's a wonderful thing, you know, because that's how we're going to bust the stigma. Mm -hmm. But anyways, I could go on all day talking to you. I don't want to talk too much more about Crip Camp because I really don't want to be a spoiler. I want people to just watch the movie. So um, it's always so good to see and hear from you. Do you have any last comments to share with our audience? I just think that it's um, important for people to um, not only read the books and look at Crip Camp, but to read other people's books, um, to look at what's going on in our elementary schools or high schools or universities as far as inclusion of history and social studies in the area of disability. Um, I think it's disability is something everybody needs to be thinking about because we're all hoping to become older. And one of the things that goes on sometimes when you're older is that you have a visual disability, auditory or both, um, a physical disability, some memory issues. Um, and if we're planning for our future, we can be looking more proactively at how is the housing in our communities being constructed? What is the community-based services or personal assistance that you may need in your home in order to stay in your home? Um, how much money do I have? Does Medicare or Medicaid help me get any of these benefits? And to really engage much earlier so that when you're 60, 65, 70, 75, you don't find yourself in a situation where you can't stay in your home, you bought a place you shouldn't have bought. And equally importantly, I think to really work with your state and local governments on things like what are the standards that are required to be used for new construction, Yes, just as an example. So I want the audience to be engaged, speak up, speak out, and uh, to look at what you're doing in your daily lives, uh, whether or not you're a part of a solution in your communities and your businesses to really ensuring that disabled people can be employed, can speak up if they have invisible disabilities without fear of retribution. Terrific. Thank you so much. It's great. Yeah, this was fun. Thank you. Thank you.